Welcome to everybody watching this. My name is Janati Stolirov II. I'm the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. And I will begin this discussion by reading Section 1 of the U.S. Transhumanist Party platform. So this was the first section of our platform that our members ever adopted. The subject of privacy was so important to us that we believed it crucial early on during my tenure as chairman to take a stand on this set of issues. And this section one reads as follows. The United States Transhumanist Party strongly supports individual privacy and liberty over how to apply technology to one's personal life. The United States Transhumanist Party holds that each individual should remain completely sovereign in the choice to disclose or not to disclose personal activities, preferences, and beliefs within the public sphere. As such, the United States Transhumanist Party opposes all forms of mass surveillance and any intrusion by governmental or private institutions upon non-coercive activities that an individual has chosen to retain within his, her, or its private sphere. However, the United States Transhumanist Party also recognizes that no individuals should be protected from peaceful criticism of any matters that those individuals have chosen to disclose within the sphere of public knowledge and discourse. So this is very much a vision of individual sovereignty with regard to privacy. The idea is each of us owns the information about our own lives and the prerogative to choose to share or not to share that information with other people. And if we choose to share it, we have to accept the consequences of doing so. So if we say something about ourselves and another person dislikes it or criticizes it, we run that risk. But if we choose to withhold that information and keep it private, keep it within our own realm, then nobody else has the right to insist on that information unless we're harming somebody else, unless that information might be used in the commission of a crime, for instance, or evidence in a criminal proceeding. So there are situations where preventing harm to others might override somebody's privacy, but those are extreme situations. We shouldn't acquiesce to routine violations of our privacy for the sake of some perceived larger goal. And hence, the mass surveillance systems, for instance, the systems used by the National Security Agency in the United States that Edward Snowden disclosed, rightly so in my view, in 2013, should be seen as particularly appalling and an abuse of technology. That's not to say there's no room for technology that harvests data on a broader level, but there should be consent with the use of that technology. And that consent should be genuine, not just clicking through some screens where there's a user agreement that nobody reads, but an actual understanding by each person of what they're giving away when they're agreeing to use that service. And I would say this is an important subject to discuss because technologies for monitoring and tracking individual activity have certainly been developing. We are well into the so-called age of big data, where not just governments, but a lot of private companies try to make a living off of harvesting individuals' personal information and monetizing it. I would say a fairly benign form of monetization is the kind that essentially uses personal information to feed you advertisements, but you are free to choose to purchase the product or click on the ad or not. But you're still a free agent within the market economy when you do that. And it could be a little bit annoying, but most people accept that because they get some free service like YouTube or Facebook. So I'm actually not so concerned about that. I am concerned about essentially these data brokers collecting personal information and then third parties using that information to make major business decisions or decisions with social implications toward an individual. For instance, let's say you're a health enthusiast and you post a lot of comments on Facebook about how you want to cure cancer or you want to cure diabetes, and you're posting about healthy lifestyles, and you think you're also performing a public service because you're informing other people of the value of healthy lifestyles. But a lot of these algorithms that mine your personal information are not particularly intelligent, at least not yet, and they're devoid of context. So what they'll be seeing is a lot of reference to cancer, to diabetes, and they'll flag you 
as a person who's associated with these terms. And perhaps a third party, maybe a health insurer, is going to purchase that information. And unless somebody is there to protect you from the misuse of that information, that third party might decide, hmm, you're at a high risk for cancer or diabetes, even though you've posted nothing of the sort. It's just the stupid text mining software that made that inference. And so they might decide, to raise your premiums or not issue you health insurance. And there are actually regulatory protections today, by the way, that would prevent that particular situation from happening. But the reason why I bring this up is if there are no protections for privacy, if there's no attempt to restrict somebody from doing that, then anything goes essentially in that kind of field. And we need to be very deliberate about policies that ensure that your data is your property, just like your physical belongings are your property. And then with your physical belongings, you can choose to keep them or you can choose to sell them. And if you sell them, then you don't have control over what happens to them afterward. Or you could choose to rent them. So you have a house, for instance, or you have some furniture. You can choose to rent it to somebody else under certain conditions. And you could say, okay, you may take possession of this, use it in certain ways, but not in certain other ways. And there could be limited prerogatives that you could give to your data. So for instance, with Facebook, you can tell Facebook, I agree to have my data used by these advertisers, but I don't agree to have my data given over to health insurers, government authorities, other types of entities that might use the information for purposes that I can't immediately foresee or wouldn't be comfortable with. So this is where policy is very important. And I will say one more thing that I think is informative regarding the context of this Section 1 of what is now Article 6 of the U.S. Transhumanist Party platform. It was adopted shortly after the Zoltan Istvan era. So Zoltan Istvan, when he was chairman of the Transhumanist Party, when he was campaigning for president, I think he was a bit careless with his language. So he was saying things like, oh, privacy is going to be obsolete and everyone is going to be surveilled, but it'll be for their own good. And I strongly strongly disagreed with that. A lot of other people strongly disagreed with that, even though we recognize the great benefits that Zoltan brought to the transhumanist movement, we saw it as necessary to essentially check some of that kind of rhetoric, which we don't believe to be helpful. So we adopted a pro-privacy stance in order to make sure that transhumanism isn't seen as this malignant force that might subvert people's autonomy over their own lives. Quite the contrary, we want to enhance individual autonomy. And I think privacy is an important part of that. Yes. So I think that was an interesting argument made from uh, Chairman Stolyarov about the civic argument for privacy. I believe there's also a cultural argument to be made. So the philosopher Michel Foucault's uh, famous text, Discipline and Punish, made this famous analysis of Jeremy Bentham's concept of the panopticon. Essentially, the panopticon is where you have a prison from a shape like a stadium with a tower in the center, such that the prisoners feel they are being watched at all times. And even if there is no one in that guard tower, they cannot tell that they are being watched. So they behave. It's a psychological psychological trick. And I believe the cultural argument for surveillance could be made to suggest that even the sense of being surveilled, even the sense that the NSA and these Silicon Valley companies are monitoring our data could shift our cultural health in ways that could become extremely toxic. It could sort of stratify us socially, suppress our creativity. It could create a stalemate and a preservation of the status quo if we are not encouraged to voice our authenticity. So I think that is another interesting argument that could be made on privacy. I would say that is the very embodiment of the panopticon concept in action. Life tension and aging research, we could be tackling this at a systemic level. And so, yeah, there needs to be massive change. And that's why we really need these transhumanist politicians and these political platforms to be way more involved. Because, look, it's not that we're going to be transforming it. Like, yes, we will be involved with transforming things. But this transformation is coming and we need to be, you know, manning the ship. And so we're the men for the job. And we know other men for the job also. And, you know, this is the most important conversation that exists right now. Yes, indeed. Indeed. So I would suggest that with a lot of these medical advances, the question of privacy will also become more salient because of personalized medicine and the vast amount of data 
that people will need to have gathered about themselves in order to monitor vital statistics and keep the body healthy. For instance, instead of getting blood tests at most every few months, but for many people it's once a year to measure your blood glucose level, you might have a device that measures it continuously. And you would be able to track, for instance, what leads to the greatest spikes in your blood glucose level or if it's on an uptrend, you would be able to notice that sooner and take corrective measures. So with that kind of technology, of course, in your hands, it would be amazing. It would be great to have this information and use it to guide your health decisions. But you wouldn't want just anyone to have that information about you. You wouldn't want your employer necessarily to have that information about you. You wouldn't want any decision maker with power to control the costs of your health care to have that information about you. So this is where it's important to develop a robust technical architecture of data privacy so that the people who need this information and who would benefit from it would have full access to it, but the people who would use it for ulterior ends would have no access to it without permission. And you could give permission to others to use that information as well, for instance, to your doctors or your caretakers or your family, if you need your family to know. But you wouldn't give it to just a random person on the street or yeah. someone with the power of the purse over you. My purpose, for instance, is to maximize my own health, my longevity, my well-being, my prerogatives as an individual. So I would want the information that helps me do that. I wouldn't want other people to have information that would stop me from achieving those goals. And I think that's the case with everyone who has this kind of individualist view. But with this individualist view, you need to recognize the kinds of inviolable boundaries around each individual's personal sphere that enable individuals to act to the furtherance of these ends. So if I have that prerogative over my own information, then to have it be logically consistent, it needs to be universalizable. So it needs to be applicable to every other individual as well. Is, uh... And you have the kind of governments that uh, come to capitalize on this technology. I trust many of you might be familiar with the film known as Gattaca which portrays a, a scenario in which eugenically motivated authoritarian governments could get a hold of the data and intensify the classification of people into different genetic tribes, such that class differences right now, which are relatively tame in terms of quality of life, could dramatically spin out of control, such that we are, again, organized into a genetic underclass and a genetic upperclass, this time irreversible by societal standards. And the danger of this is that what some might consider to be racism would be, in some sense, justified by the fact that the genetic changes have been made such that we regress to a point where these classes of human beings are no longer the same species. And I think that could be very dangerous if such structures ever manifested in our society. Yes, I think there's always a danger when information is used to classify rather than to improve. Because that assumes a kind of fixed, stagnant hierarchy that the information would somehow capture and clarify in a more refined manner. But in reality, much of the world is in flux, and so are people. So people are continually changing in terms of their biological potential and their intellectual potential. And this is the primary reason why it's dangerous to stratify individuals, because it assumes that whatever relative hierarchy of ability or health or what have you might exist by happenstance today is going to remain the same through time immemorial, even though empirically that's not the case. And people rise and fall all the time in accordance with whatever metrics one could think of. So imposing a rigid stratification attempts to kind of freeze the present distribution, whereas what we should be trying to do is to uplift everyone in terms of every metric that could be improved. So I'm in support of genetic modifications for both physical and mental capabilities. But those genetic modifications should be 
gateways to liberation for individuals. They shouldn't be used to enhance some people while other people are prevented somehow through some coercive apparatus from acquiring them. I find the practice of eugenics in the past, the conditions for what may have been a useful gene or unuseful gene were defined sort of a priori without any academic rigor behind it. And I think before we make such strides in allowing certain companies like 23andMe to be able to share our medical data with the government, we should put in place preventative measures that would prevent this kind of a, a priori categorization of the superior genes from the inferior genes. And I would second your take on that. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of problems with privacy right now in medical data. And it's a great point what Johnny brought up about personalized medicine, because that's about to become huge, I mean, a revolution. And, you know, our data, our medical data on the black market goes for like three times more than even our social security information and even our banking information. So people really want our medical information. And it's almost like 90% certain that your information is actually already on the black market. I don't really know too much about that, but Dr. George Church told me said that. But I actually think that I kind of I agree with Zoltan that there's going to be no privacy in the future. You know, I, a lot of uh, people yeah. think there's no privacy right now. You know yes. who those people would be? We have privacy right now. Do you guys uh, know who hard... those people would be that I'm talking about? The NSA? Uh, well, that's probably <laughs> one group. Well, even the NSA probably wouldn't think everything is being monitored. I'm talking about people who literally think everything by every human being would be monitored right now. Is it Alex Jones? No, it's anyone. What I'm getting at is anyone who believes in the simulation theory essentially believes uh, we're all in a matrix, which if that's so, the case, there is already no privacy. Yes. Because... So this idea of the simulation theory takes us back to this uh, less wrong-esque thought experiment of Rocco's Basilisk, in which we construct a hypothetical superintelligence in the future that would be able to scour our metadata for clues as to who might have been a supporter of it in the past, and then perhaps torture these beings in simulation hells and sort of retroactively incentivize its own existence. I think that's a far out idea, but I don't, I don't think we should take it too seriously. You guys want to fight for privacy? That's what all you guys want? Privacy is a key constituent component of human well-being because really each of us has and historically has had two spheres to our lives, the private sphere and the public sphere. And the private sphere is what allows us to be more effective in the public sphere. Just like I think it's a good fact of existence that other people can't look inside your mind, at least not without your permission. There is some limited telepathic communication that has been demonstrated via cutting-edge experiments a few years ago, but it's more like somebody presses a button in one country and another person can essentially feel that experience in another country. But Are you saying a... you would actually express some concern about hooking yourself up to the cloud? And putting the neural lace in your brain and putting chips in your brain? Are you actually saying you're a little skeptical of that? Well, <laughs> I would insist on some pretty stringent controls. The prerogative of each individual mind to serve as its own absolute gatekeeper. So if somebody wants a direct line of telepathic communication with me, I will want to define the parameters of that communication and say, okay, you can transmit certain information to me directly, but within certain boundaries. Like, you can transmit into my mind a picture of this meadow. I'd like to be able to envision what that meadow looks like, but nothing else, and that's all I'm giving you permission for. It's like with file uploads to computers. It's a bit of a crude analogy because the mind doesn't exactly work the way that a digital computer so you're does. You're saying you, you actually have a problem with giving over all your mind and memories and thoughts over to, like, say, a corporation like Facebook. You, you, you have actually a, you take issue with that? Like, really? <laughs> really? The idea of the system of neoliberal capital in which we all participate, an individual might actually be incentivized in order to afford this technology to perhaps trade their data in exchange for the technology. So, for instance, if Rowan would like a Neuralink and could not afford it, perhaps the company might offer his data as leverage. Perhaps Rowan could allow them to have a one-year free trial period of his brain and the collection of his metadata in exchange for being able to use the product. And I think that is one way in which people could be coerced into the panopticon to have their thoughts privatized by corporations. I don't think Elon Musk has vo voiced any intent to do so, but I do believe it could serve. Uh, something it, something actually... like that is already going on. Have you guys heard this aging app that like makes your face age? And a lot of people oh, were yes. using it. And then as a yes. result of doing that, it basically signed away the rights to your face to this app company, yes. and they own the rights to your face forever. They can use your likeness. So
I would say to the point that this person live streams official functions of government, like attendance at meetings or deliberative processes over policy or even, say, trips to meet constituents for his campaign or because he's their representative and he wants to connect with them, that would be a positive. People can tune in and see what this official is up to. But there are personal aspects to everyone's life that should shouldn't be broadcast to the public, particularly because they create situations of personal vulnerability. A very simple and fairly tame example is I wouldn't want to be live streamed while I'm asleep because you could even think back to a very primal motivation for that. If you're asleep and you're a primitive paleolithic human, you're probably in a cave or by a campfire somewhere and you want to make sure that you're protected. If somebody is watching you while you're asleep, you don't know what they're going to do to you. They might stab you with a sharp object while you're asleep. They might hit you over the head and take your stuff. In any event, you want to be sure that when you're asleep, everything is completely secure and protected and you're not subject to that kind of danger. And besides, what use would it be to the public? What benefits? They loved it in the movie Truman Show. They loved watching Harry Truman sleep. It was like their entertainment. They would tune in and watch him sleep and, you know. Hey, but how are uh, we going to... Wait, wait, before we go on, I got to ask you guys, how are we going to institute a system of perfect justice without, you know, totally monitoring everyone's thoughts? How are we going to have a system of pre-crime, like a minority report, so where we monitor what they're going to do before they even do it and then put them in jail before they even do it, right? Ah, uh, yes. I'm just joking, Absolutely. of course. That, I'm not in favor of that. I'm just being ironic. Term. What chances do you think that we already have a social credit system like China and what ours is not public. Like we don't know, but just like China is being monitored well, all the time, what if we already well, have one like that? Well, what do you guys think of the chances? That, right? What? With Snowden. I was gonna jump in. So yeah, I mean Snowden, right? In WikiLeaks, right? Didn't they provide a lot of evidence for that? Yeah. So I wanted to express to you guys to that we likely have to fight for no privacy because you know I agree with Donati that Zoltan doesn't really articulate this very well, and this is you know a super touchy subject. And if you're running for presidency, it's like you know you're gonna want to be able to explain this really well. And so there's reasons why we should have no privacy, right? Well, first off, reducing privacy is gonna reduce a lot of crime. You know how are you gonna abduct somebody when you only have self cars on the road right that are analyzing everything you have humanoid robots walking everywhere recording everything constantly we already have alexas that are in over 70 million americans houses and they actually there's some cases of them calling cops and so privacy is going to go away quite a bit and so we're only going to be stuck with our thoughts now well that's going to go away i think because so once we develop long distance brain computer interfaces which i've actually heard some people in the government say that it's already been developed but once you have something advanced enough that's long distance maybe from a satellite or something imagine hacking into someone's brain and you control their motor functions their sensory functions right those two gyruses right here and so you could hack them and you can make them seem like they're doing you know they're normal on the outside but on the inside they're in living hell which would be the most evil thing that is going to occur in the next 15 20 years maybe even 10 years you know within governments and so we're going to need how are we going to prevent from being hacked well we might need to actively survey constantly so, you know who you sound like right now? The main guy from the circle who says knowing is good, <laughs> but knowing but knowing everything is better. Like, you're that guy yeah. right now. You're making that argument that I just predicted. Uh, have you guys ever compared or have found parallels between social credit system, like something in China, and basically what every religious person believes, which is like basically God monitoring everyone. It's like the eye in the sky. It is basically... The omniscient God. It's the, it's, omniscient it's, it's the divine social credit system. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Yeah, so, which so is common why... Time. I promote we should fear the hypothetical God that we could be already trapped in the matrix. There could be the AI God monitoring everything, judging us, determining which of us gets to live forever. It's like part of my eternal life strategy is to be considerate of that possibility, at least. So Rowan, are you familiar with the work of Dr. Yuval Noah Harari? He actually espouses your position here, the idea that this new God will emerge. He, In his work, Homo Deus, he talks to this new religion called Dataism. And it's essentially Christianity for the information age. What he's saying is that these algorithms we're creating, eventually they'll come to govern us better than human beings can. So the AI, which is distributed across all our search engines, our smartphones, our self-driving cars, will all start sharing data and become this global consciousness, this digital God, which will be directing our movements. So Harari, interestingly, 
interestingly enough, agrees with you. And he argues for this sort of neo-reactionary techno-monarchist kind of position whereby this artificial superintelligence would then be able to understand you better than you understand yourself. And Harari believes we should sort of relinquish government control to this digital monarch, to this AI god. Oh. And uh, this AI god would be like Santa Claus. He would know who's sleeping, who's awake. He'd know how to deal with them. He'd know how to reward them. Uh, speaking of which, he would know this god, this He'd digital god. He'd be the ultimate, ultimate matchmaker. He'd be able to set yes. you up with the perfect He'd be able eternal to set you up with, yeah. yeah, he'd be able to set uh, you uh, up with uh, ideal mate, so to speak. And I believe the system of government is called algocracy, and it's a very authoritarian system that I'd like to hear Janati comment on to see how this would uh, perhaps contrast with their libertarian leanings. So as uh, an atheist I, and a uh, neo-enlightenment thinker, I reject all gods, including future AI gods. I believe in human free will. I believe that we as individuals have the power of choice and to be able to decide to defy any proclivities or predictions. This is why I think the concept of pre-crime is antithetical to genuine justice, to get back to an earlier point that was raised, because at every moment we have the ability to decide to do something or to decide not to do it, no matter what background we have, no matter what genetics we have, no matter what ostensible predispositions we have. So even if a predictive algorithm says you're 99.9% .9 likely to commit a crime, at any moment you can choose not to. You can choose to take the courses of action that would essentially lead you in the correct direction. This is why the principle of being innocent until proven guilty, the principle of having individual rights, having the benefit of the doubt is so important. And privacy allows that. Now, Rowan asked, well, how do we prevent injustice in such a situation? I think the answer is very simple. Most people actually have no intention to commit crime most of the time. If you think about society today and how easy it would actually be for somebody to steal something if they wanted to and get away with it. The fact that this doesn't happen left and right would suggest to you that the vast majority of people actually don't want to steal most of the time. There are a few who do, and they cause trouble, and they cause enough trouble to keep the law enforcement busy. They cause enough trouble for everyone else to take rudimentary precautions against their belongings being stolen. But the fact is, most people are decent enough that they don't want to commit crime, and so they don't need to be surveilled. It's the same argument that I and many other libertarians have been making for years against TSA surveillance. The fact is most people aren't terrorists or even close. So subjecting them to these surveillance procedures only creates but, unnecessary violations of privacy. Do you think it's strategically wise to, if not surveil people, at least promote the idea that they might be being surveyed without them knowing? We could promote the idea that everything they do might be watched, everything they do might be recorded. So based upon the idea of being better safe than sorry, people might be afraid. People might be more afraid to do immoral things. They might be more afraid to commit crimes, and therefore you'd see a promotion of morality in society. It's the same concept that, like, religion, the idea of a god, right? Wouldn't that promote morality in a population if they think everything they're doing is being watched and monitored? That could make people behave more morally. Do you think that could be? That creates a chilling effect, though. And Alex alluded to this earlier on. The idea that you're being monitored could also stifle your creativity, your harmless experimentation, because you always have this inkling that the monitoring may be subject to different standards from your own standards. So your own standards might be don't kill, don't steal, don't abuse people, and that's fine. But the standards of those doing the monitoring monitoring could be, you need to wear gray shirts all the time, or you need to conform in other respects to cultural or societal expectations. And this is the kind of chilling effect that happens when people think that they're being watched. The simple answer is we can trust most people most of the time not to commit malfeasance. The key is how do you detect the very few who are actually going to be a problem? And I would say the answer to that isn't continuous monitoring of everyone's activity. It's enough engagement with those people to be able to spot warning signs. So one of the reasons why a lot of the school shooters or other lone wolf type criminals were able to get away with mass atrocities that have taken a few tens of lives each time was because they largely did not communicate their situation or their thoughts to other people. And other people largely didn't care enough about them to actually check in periodically. 
in prior eras when communities tended to be smaller and more geographically localized, it would have been very hard for someone to get away with such a scheme because people would come by their houses every so often and say hello and drop by for tea. And people in agricultural societies, for instance, would spend a lot of their time outside. So if you were in a particular community, chances are you were seen many times per day. And I'm not suggesting that we go back to that era. There is obviously a lot of benefit to living in these larger communities with more anonymity, but we should get back into a situation where everyone has some kind of supportive social network. I'm just going to take over for Rowan here. We could segue on to a different topic. So we've got this yeah. sort of, I, I can see sort of two worldviews forming here. We got on one side, you have Bobby and Rowan with this idea that yes, we should surrender ourselves to the algorithms, to the algocracy, to the rule by algorithms such that they can perform utilitarian reduction of, so so far, reduction of uh, poverty. And on the other side, I see we have Janati claiming, no, we have this idea of Kantian libertarianism, free will, rather than your determinism, your techno-determinism, and we would prefer that we make the decisions and not the algorithms. What my question to you guys is, is could you possibly foresee another a civil war between this determinist view and this Kantian view, whereby the people who believe in free will will stand their ground and those who don't will submit to this algocracy? Do you think these worldviews could clash, perhaps create violence, and do you know which would prevail over the long run? Do you think there ever could be a synthesis between this uh, sort of neoliberalism and neo-reaction? So it might be inevitable that we have no privacy, So, but it's certainly inevitable that we're going to decrease in privacy by a lot over the next 10, 20 years. So it's really about steering that, right? Because no one's going to be able to stop this progress. An asteroid is not going to hit us, okay? An asteroid hasn't came for a while. It's not going to come in 20 years. Very statistically unlikely. Bobby, what I, do you think the chances are that maybe we already don't have any privacy, that we're in a simulation? Uh, I don't know if I've ever asked you that before. Do you think uh, we could be potentially in a yeah, simulation well, everything we're doing is being monitored and used against you in the court of eternal life? Oh. Janati, you were saying something really interesting. You were saying that it may be not be good that people think they're being monitored because then mm -hmm. they would kind of be afraid to experiment. Uh, they'd be afraid to do all these things that maybe are innocent, but they would be worried, mm -hmm. oh, maybe they're going to get in trouble for it. The way of cancel culture. It's and kind such. of yeah. a, a very similar situation to what we already have with religion, right? People thinking, well, I can't do this and that because God might be watching me, right? Um, but think about this. If you replace God with the hypothetical God and then say, well, we can't really know what the rules of this hypothetical God are, they could be anything, right? We kind of have to fill in. It becomes a big question mark. What would this God, this hypothetical God, be monitoring us for? What would be the criteria of judgment? And if instead of giving like a defined set of rules, like all these religions, give us they give us the holy books or whatever if we just said you know it could be anything like have your best guess you know then they would be filling in that question mark with whatever they think it would be uh if there was a hypothetical god this is what i try to do with the hypothetical god i, I try to make people consider that okay maybe their actions might be watched and might be judged but we wouldn't know how they would be judged. We wouldn't really know what the rules are. We kind of have to guess what the rules are. You think that doing this, at least thinking in this way and considering that possibility could be strategic personally, but then also might benefit society if they were to kind of have the idea that what they're doing might be judged in some sense, that there'd be a system of judgment or some kind of karmic system that we can't define clearly, but that the idea that there could be some kind of system like that where every action they're doing could have consequences, eternal consequences in this thing. I think that it could make society society better. What do you think? Well, I have two thoughts on that. First of all, historically, humans have been very adept at interpreting and reinterpreting theological doctrines to kind of fit what they were intending to do anyway. People have a knack for inventing elaborate justifications for their actions and then persuading themselves that, oh, this is what a hypothetical God would have wanted to do. But second, we don't need a hypothetical God for that tendency anyway, because we could think from the standpoint of eventual consequences of one's actions. However, those consequences arise just through the workings of the laws of nature. If you do X, then Y might eventually happen, or it might not. The world is complex, but you think there's a higher probability of Y eventually happening, and you would configure your actions. But the difference between that kind of thinking, the hypothetical God thinking, or the thinking of causation through the laws of nature, some obscure chain of causation, and predictive algorithms that actually try to surveil people or try to classify them, is that the latter would be very much real. And 
and very definite in their operations. So people might be guessing at what they're doing, just like right now, a lot of people are guessing at what financial behaviors will affect their credit scores, as an example. But the fact is, those algorithms would be programmed in very definite ways, and those ways may or may not be conducive to optimal human well-being. My view is algorithms of this sort would need to be transparent. They would need to be available to the public, and the public should have input over how they're designed and how they're deployed, especially if there's a broader societal purpose. Now, not every predictive algorithm necessarily affects individual privacy. For instance, if it's a road maintenance algorithm and its goal is to set up an optimal schedule for repairing the roads or sweeping the roads or deciding which roads to prioritize after a snowstorm, that's a fine algorithm to deploy. Everyone would benefit from it. There's no loss of privacy from that. But people should still know how it works. People should be able to audit the code and they should be able to point out vulnerabilities, just like with open source software today. The best software is one that actually has the code fully available, and then various so-called white hat hackers are able to look at the code and see, well, how is this vulnerable to bugs? How can we improve this code so as to patch those vulnerabilities? Whereas closed source systems often have exploits that were actually there from the beginning, the zero day exploits, but people don't figure out the existence of those exploits for many years. And then after millions of people already have this operating system or this program installed, some black hat hacker figures out how to compromise that system. So I think we need transparency of the AIs, of the algorithms, of the monitoring systems. But at the same time, we need to preserve the individual sphere of experimentation. I like to think of one's thoughts as a kind of testing ground. They're preliminary. You don't necessarily want everything that is ruminating in your mind to be instantly made available. You want to work on it. You want to correct any mistakes with it or any preconceptions. Just like if you're working on a piece of writing. You don't necessarily want people to see the first letter you typed or the first version of a sentence that you typed. You want to present your product when it's ready, when you think you've done enough work on it, that it's prepared for other people to provide their feedback and their reactions. I'm interested in how he'd deal with what Janati described, the scenario in which we must change the way in which we develop these, not necessarily super intelligences, but algorithms in general. We need to make them more decentralized and open source, such that the regular person could have input into how these algorithms are programmed, such that the AIs we're creating are built to do more than just sell us advertisements. And I believe Elon Musk has this project called OpenAI, and he's sort of doing some pioneering work there, whereby he's trying to create a decentralized AI with a transparent source code. But I think we need to do a little more. I think we perhaps need to bring blockchain into the picture, sort of an AI based on blockchain, whereby the editing of this algorithm could be sort of like Wikipedia, whereby the people, us, could have input into how these algorithms are created. And then we only choose to use the social networks which adopt this decentralized method of AI. And I hope to one day delete my Twitter. I hope to delete my Facebook. I hope to delete my YouTube in favor of these more decentralized artificial intelligences that will be the sort of social networks of the future, the artificial intelligence social networks. And I wonder if you would have any policies that could sort of be conducive to breaking up these big companies and their control on our government sort of sharing data with the NSA and collaborating to bring the boot down on us, the people, and what you could possibly do about this. I could sort of pose another question about religion. So this is a topic I assume a lot of us are looking to get into. I assume everyone on this call is an atheist with the exception of me and Rowan, Rowan being a classical theist, me being more of a Spinozian pantheist. But the idea of religion is uh, very concerning to people in the discourse of transhumanism. And I believe some religious ideologies may be forcing their way back into transhumanism themselves. Themselves. I don't know if Chairman Stolyarov, you've heard of Anthony Lewandowski. So Anthony I Lewandowski know. is a Silicon Valley billionaire who has recently started his own church. So I've been calling him uh, the Pope Lewandowski. He sort of started this robot cult by which they worship, not necessarily Rocco's Basilisk, but they sort of pledge their loyalty to this future artificial superintelligence, which will collect their metadata and find who's loyal. So in, in some sense, he's organizing kind of a hierarchy, a clerical hierarchy with him at the top and sort of the priests at the bottom. But there's a problem here. This could lead to, I take this very seriously, what Rowan said about about Nick Bostrom's simulation argument, because this idea of simulationism, as some have called to call it futuristic religion, is predicated on Bostrom's hypothesis 
could manifest as actual world religions that would take over the power vacuum left behind by Islam and Christianity should they fade away completely. These new religions would take up this power vacuum. I assume that perhaps the anarchists and the libertarians could form sort of a coalition to sort of address how we would fight against these new monarchies and theocracies, that techno-theocracies that could emerge in the future and lead to the same sort of suppression of human rights and human suffering as has occurred in the past from these sort of cult-like organizations in general. Yeah. Do you think that we have a sort of a plan for how we would address the return of fundamentalist religions? Good so, question to mm -hmm. Yes, so my thought is to counter any kind of fundamentalist religion, one needs to have an environment of broad tolerance and cosmopolitanism. So I'm an atheist, but I'm not a militant atheist. And certainly the USTP has been welcoming to various strains of religions as long as the individuals espousing them have themselves been tolerant. Now, I'll make a generalization. It doesn't always apply, but newer and recently established religions tend to be more fanatical and more exclusivist than older religions. And the reason why is older religions simply have had more time to kind of integrate themselves into the broader world and the broader society. And when Judaism was in its early stages, read the Old Testament. The Jews were some of the most aggressive genocidal people out there. Early Christianity was filled with fanatics and political persecution. Yes, history, history may not repeat itself, but yeah. it does rhyme. Right, right. And of course, during well, the uh, early uh, days sure. of Islamic expansionism, right. there was a lot of bloodshed as well. And out of the three Abrahamic religions today, Islam is the youngest and the religion that has the greatest problems oh. with fanaticism. So, so age plays a role. Yes. I think Noam Chomsky would make a really good argument for that Christians are the most fanatical and, you know, the biggest terrorists of the world. Well, would you, would there, you like to elaborate there, on that, perhaps? There were eras in human history, like during the time of the Crusades, when the Muslims, by and large, tended to be more cultured and more humane than the Christians. But I would say someone like Noam Chomsky also has an axe to grind in the sense that his enemies, strictly speaking, are very close to him. They're the Christian right in the United States. So sometimes he invades against the Christian right, but he forgets that the worst of the Christian right aren't going to cut off people's heads for apostasy. And that's important to keep in mind as well. I'd like to take a moment with Rowan's idea and Chairman Stolyarov's idea and sort of expand them a little bit. So Bobby said, I, I agree with Stolyarov's assertion that the newer the religion, the more fanatical, because it has less discourse, less time for the dialectic to sort of develop in that religion. And we do see that the Jewish religion is the most liberal, followed by Christianity, a little less liberal, and lastly, Islam, the newest religion, being the least liberal of all. And I do believe there's a necessity for time for uh, religions to become de-radicalized, and that certainly does pose a danger. If these new techno-theocracies come about, they would be new religions, perhaps even more fanatical than Islam, and perhaps Islam would be the least of our problems. But to also agree with Rowan, I believe, and contrast with Bobby here, I don't think the Crusades are a very good example of uh, religious fundamentalism. I believe the Crusades had a geopolitical motivation initially. The Seljuk Turks sort of aggressed upon the Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine Empire enlisted the help of the Western powers to sort of create a holy cause to come geopolitically assist the Byzantine people and the people who were conquered by the Seljuk Turks. And I do believe there was some justification in this, not necessarily the holy war, but the geopolitical war, that these people were now subject to the brutal, violent rule of the Seljuk Turks. But it depends on which of the Crusades we're talking about. I'm, of course, talking about the first. Right. But it's, it's a whole can of worms we don't want to open. But I would agree with Chairman Stolyarov's insight as to how we could possibly categorize religions in terms of their radicalization. But how do you think we could de-radicalize these techno-theocracies that could come about? Well, I think the question is whether some of these newer religions could potentially become more fanatical and more illiberal than some of the more traditionalist religions in their resistance to a more open techno-futurist yes, vision. It's not necessarily the ethnic origins of these founders of these religions because the cult structure exists across all mm -hmm. racial boundaries. For example, the Mormon church also used to have a very cult-like structure, but they too have liberalized. So we do see this sort of decline of the cult structure as there are critiques of the religion. But it's interesting how Rowan brought up what would the transhumanist party's opinion on Islam would be. How do you think we could integrate Muslims into the transhumanist world? To have my input on theism that you guys were discussing, I think the next step for atheists 
for the atheist movement. You know, right now it's, it's kind of like atheists just kind of ridicule theists, right? It's really easy to make fun of a theist because they believe in ridiculous things and they don't know science very well often. I don't think it's that ridiculous. Bostrom simulation argument has been one of the most fascinating arguments for Christianity in the past thousand years. Not since Aquinas have we had such a sophisticated argument for God. But yeah, well, but look at all the videos of all the theists like being made fun of, you know? And so I think the next step for atheism is to, instead of ridiculing theists, now we have to heal theists, right? Like, I see so many people making fun of deathists, for example. You know, you're not supposed to make fun of these people, okay? That's not funny, okay? We need to heal them, okay? We need to convince them that life is more important than death. So, so uh, Rowan, I don't know if you know about Elon Musk uh, and his belief in Rocco's Basilisk, but that's actually how he got the date with Grimes, is uh, he sh- sort of shared that thought experiment with her. I've been reading this book called Polystate, A Thought Experiment for a Distributed Government. And the author, Zach Wienersmith, I believe, he speculates on this idea that perhaps a futuristic form of government could allow, let's say, I know you're familiar with the division between red states and blue states, the two Americas. There are two Americas right now, and the sort of center is disappearing. And a lot of the street violence we see is an inability of these people to get along. So Zach Wienersmith, his book, The Polystate, has a sort of solution for this, whereby which uh, this sort of digital governance could create two states within one state. The polystate is a geopolitical entity in which overlapping states exist side by side, but you are subject only to the laws of one state, whereby which, for example, California, you could change your statesmanship, you could get a new citizenship and not be part of the blue state government of California, and you could have an overlapping red state government. So this is the idea of the polystate, whereby which two governments can exist in the same country. This is a solution we could be looking towards if the division continues to persist. I was wondering, because you are of the libertarian persuasion that one's income should go to policies in which they actually support, for example, I think it's horrible that we force Democrats to pay for the wall using their tax money, or that we force Republicans to pay for whatever welfare programs they hate, or that we force everybody to pay for these horrible wars in the Middle East. And what I think the poly state could do is it could sort of direct your tax revenue to policies which you actually support. So by state within a state, I don't mean two separate countries in one state. I mean two different revenue collection systems by which all the Republican taxpayers would pay to the Republican government and their money would be spent on Republican policies. Whereas with Democrats, all their tax money would be spent on Democrat policies. And this could sort of erode the culture war because you would no longer have that stress that you're paying for your own persecution. There's this other idea. I don't know if you're familiar with the economist and physicist Robin Hansen. I do believe he is of the libertarian political persuasion, perhaps even anarcho-capitalist. He's written famous books like The Age of M. He has this other idea called futarchy, I believe, futarchism, whereby we don't vote on values, but we bet on beliefs. Sort of like we have elected representatives that would formally define and manage this numerical operating system of uh, sort of national welfare and market speculators would sort of price these beliefs and they would sort of like estimate like sort of adopting particular policies based on sort of the quantification of gambling on these systems. We've touched on economics quite a bit. Do you think we could ever move to a a UBI system, which would sort of create a new paradigm for capital? Or even better, there's this other former economic advisor in the Greek government, Yanis Varoufakis. He doesn't like universal basic income. He wants universal basic dividends. So that's another idea we could look into. That's sort of like the citizens benefiting from the corporations themselves, sort of like universal stockholders, like universal stock shares rather than universal payouts. Actually, I wanted to bring up the leftist critique of UBI. In a sense, many leftist thinkers are saying that UBI is actually a reactionary movement disguised as a progressive movement. One example being perhaps we get the $4,000 a month and then the landlord says, hey, guess what? I know everyone's got $4,000 a month. I'm going to raise your rent by $4,000. Essentially, even a lot of the right-wing people are arguing that this could cause inflation, whereby the government's just giving you back your own money. But the sort of stratified class structure between the upper class and lower class remains. And I think some of these leftists are calling for, instead of universal basic income, we have universal basic stock dividend, whereby we own the means of production digitally. I think a lot of UBI advocacy has fallen out of favor with the left do you think that could be perhaps too extreme to ever so adopt I have a bit of a basic stock to that. yeah go ahead. because inflation really is a function of how much money is chasing real goods and services so yes. yes if you just print a bunch of money and hand it out to people prices are going to rise they're going to rise for some people faster than for others, depending on where that new money is injected and who has the initial boost of purchasing power before the prices kind of equilibrate to absorb that impact of the new money supply. However, if you actually have more real productivity that supports the new income, 
then you will not have that effect of increasing real prices. So if you have a federal land dividend to accompany the universal basic income, then what that means is companies are being productive on that land. They are creating goods which enter the economy. So whatever money is entering the economy as kind of a measure of value is in reference to those newly created goods. So this is how inflationary pressures would be averted. Now, I am wary of schemes that would increase taxes on people and redistribute existing wealth for purposes of funding a universal basic income, because at best, it would just shift the purchasing power that exists from some people to others. But in the long term, we need to grow the so-called economic pie. We cannot cling to this zero-sum fixed pie mentality. And this is why I don't believe a tax-based or money-printing-based UBI would work. I think it needs to be a UBI supported by increases in real productivity. So, so this this is an, another interesting, very controversial topic because the federal land dividend, I suppose, this the response from the left would be this idea that the environmentalism, that this federal land, most of it being in Idaho, Montana, like if you look at a map of the United States from space, you could tell where the federal land is. And now imagine that full of economic activity, full of bustling cities and whatnot. And obviously real estate prices would go down as people would go build there. Companies would develop the land and build homes on it. So essentially the environmentalists, there would be a huge outcry from this. But your ideology, this form of economics you're proposing, it's very familiar to a lot of people. I assume uh, Donati might be familiar with the term Georgism. In addition to like the other economic schools, such as the Austrian school, which is Rothbard and Mises, the Chicago school, which is Friedman, or um, the Keynesian school, which is Keynes, the Marxian school. But the Georgist school, essentially, it's very libertarian in the sense that you own the value you produce. But the land, land ownership, is sort of ours. It's ours. And we use that to provide, to take care of the poorest in society through like federal land taxes and such. Would you say a lot of your economic policies in inspired by Georgism? I will say I myself am not a Georgist. I've actually written in opposition to land taxation and in support of private property in land. I would classify myself as a proprietarian, essentially. Kurt Doolittle style? <laughs> proprietary. Well, I'm a Lockean, essentially. Oh, okay. So I believe in First of all, there is the state of nature, and unused land is essentially in the state of nature. The person who mixes his labor with the land is entitled to the proceeds, but it has to be actual constructive mixing of labor. You can't just have an arbitrary claim like the King of England had a claim over all the forests in England and people would be executed for hunting there, even though that was their only means of livelihood. So I am in favor of people owning land just as I'm in favor of people owning tangible objects, just as I'm in favor of people owning data about themselves. There are some issues with the Georgist land tax. I have essays on that. Feel free to look them up. But I think we should have some closing statements during the last few minutes of this live stream on some of the original subjects such as the future of privacy and surveillance. And I can begin and then we can go in turn to everybody. So my statement would bring it back to the aspirations of transhumanism. Transhumanism I think would not be the intellectual framework that it is without an intense focus on the desire to preserve the individual, hence the pursuit of life extension, hence attempts to perhaps merge the biological and the technological in that quest for self-preservation. But I think there's also the necessity to preserve the sphere of autonomy of the individual mind. It would be a frightening prospect if in the future all individual minds were completely interconnected all of the time to the point where the distinction between where one person ends and another person begins would be blurred. I think for the transhumanist project to succeed, we need to remain these self-contained autonomous entities where if we do connect, we always connect on our own terms per our own wishes. And it's always based on the principle of consent and it's always a set of interactions that could be opted out of. And I think it's fundamentally a question of technological architecture. All of this can be achieved, and the goal of privacy can be respected and preserved in the course of developing brain-computer interfaces, telepathy, various predictive algorithms, artificially intelligent systems. 
It's just a matter of having the will. Just as with most projects and technology in society, if there's a will, there will be a way. So that is my view on the future of privacy. I believe privacy and transhumanism are quite compatible, and indeed privacy is an integral component of the transhumanist pursuit of self-preservation. Very good. So final thoughts on privacy. I don't know how familiar many of us are with the Hegelian dialectic, but it is our nature as human beings to engage in discourses with each other so that we can arrive closer to the truth. We can clash the thesis with the antithesis. We can sort of critique the class structure, critique the race structure, sort of dissolve the differences between us. And I do think there will come a day when we will all be one mind. I just don't know how far that day is. And I don't think people should necessarily be dragged kicking and screaming through the dialectic. They should be able to arrive at enlightenment through their own rational method. I do not think we should instate a panopticon-like society or a social credit system. And for many of the determinists who would side with Lewandowski, the sort of Rocco's Basilisk techno-monarchists, I would strongly advise we find another way. We should not be creating these artificial intelligence systems to be separate entities from us. They should be an extension of ourselves in McLuhan's terms. We should make our technologies more open source. We should all have a say in these very um, existentially defining inventions we will make, perhaps the last invention we will ever have to make. And I think we should all invent this thing together. Final thoughts, Bobby? (laughs) Nice, man. So privacy, it may, the future may unfold and will likely unfold, I think, in which we will have to have a surveillance instead of surveillance, and we will have absolutely no privacy. And that's for a number of reasons, you know, we could touch on next time. And which means that, you know, that's scary, right? And, you know, that's why we need Janati really succeeding with the political platforms. Extremely important, everyone. So go become a transhumanist member at the United States Transhumanist Party. You can sign up. It doesn't matter where you're at. And make sure you support the United States Transhumanist Party. And so, of course, become a Chronics member. Life insurance, when you're young, is really cheap. It's only like $20 a month. Term life insurance. Not a life insurance agent. Go talk to one. And there's life extension treatments coming out. And, yeah, I look forward to living with all of you forever. Awesome. Thank you, audience, for coming. As far as the main question we've been talking about privacy, I guess my thoughts would be consider that maybe the scariest thing already did happen and that we've already lost our privacy. Maybe we were trapped in some weird matrix. So that's just something we should, I think we should consider as part of our eternal life strategy that what if everything we're doing is already being monitored and watched and potentially used to determine like what if there's somebody with the control switch on our life and could just turn us off or like turn our programming off turn us into an npc robot or whatever and just kill us or something or you know there's just some power structure already in place that decides if we get to live forever and use this possibility in your eternal life strategy that's what i would tell the eternal life fans consider that i guess fear the hypothetical ai god that might already be trapped us in their matrix potentially all right that's my thoughts on that any other closing statements last chances yeah i'd definitely like to talk with john more on economics he seems very sharp and well-versed and insightful on the subject so yeah. maybe we could set up a future live stream where we could perhaps grow intellectually from such a discussion yeah but, uh, uh, we'll bring up georgism again we'll, we'll... I think that's an interesting discussion i'd say may you live forever death to the reaper and maybe this is for zuckerberg some honorary bird for zuckerberg wajijiki and the mainstream media who is using ai for the purposes of evil to divide us and turn us on each other for the purposes of profit hopefully that's the last bird i'll ever have and we will create new social networks new decentralized networks where we will no longer need you and we can govern ourselves well heck we can't end it giving the bird to zuckerberg freak i love zuckerberg he's on i think zuckerberg's on our side just i think he's against us he wants to help us uh, live forever he wants to help us live i I rededicate sorry rowan i rededicate this bird to susan wajijiki and, um, okay, I'm fine with that. But I, <laughs> Zuckerberg, likes her. I'm telling you guys, Zuckerberg is an eternal life fan. He wants us to live forever. He said he's most interested in questions about people. What will enable us to live forever? He's trying to put his money behind curing diseases with this country. Let me phrase that. Okay, okay. Mr. Zuck, perhaps one day there could come a time where we could put aside our differences and create a better social network that will not use algorithmic supremacy to promote hatred and division among Americans. And perhaps we could build a better world where we are more socially conscious of how we are using our technology. But Susan Wojcicki can keep the bird. I don't think anyone likes her. (laughs) maybe an interview with Janati. Definitely. We... we should pick his brain more. You don't upload as much as it used to. I, I'm interested in how much you have grown and developed over the many years. You've been busy, of course, as the chairman of the Transhumanist Party. We'd like to hear more of your wisdom that I would assume has been much more refined. We shall speak on this. That would be, certainly... that would be interesting. Yeah. All right. So. That's it. Thank you guys for showing.